afternoon, everyone, or at least it is in my time zone uh, here in Calgary on Treaty 7 land. Um, welcome to the second day of um, the Open Education Symposium for those of you who are just joining us uh, now. Um, it's great to see everybody's um, squares. <laughs> I wish that I saw your faces, all of them too. My name is Christy Hurl. I am a librarian at the University of Calgary and I will be moderating today's uh, open pedagogy talk. Um, so this is a series of talks that is running all week uh, through the Open Education Symposium. Um, but to start us off today, I want to uh, welcome uh, Chad Flynn, who is the Dean of the School of Trades and Technology at Medicine Hat College. And uh, Chad is gonna be talking about open pedagogy in the trades. So take it away, Chad. So I'm just going to jump right into it, and I'm going to say something that could be seen as a little bit controversial. And so I'm just, or said, I'm going to say something that's a little bit controversial. I think that trades education as a whole needs to be broken. Now I'm going to say that again because I think every time I do this presentation, I have some people think that I'm saying that I think that trades education is broken. I actually don't think it's broken. I think actually it seems to be working quite well. We have students coming in for four weeks to twelve weeks, depending on their years. They're in the industry for um, 80% of their time in school for 20% of their time. And we cycle them through. It's almost like a brain factory. So I had been teaching in the trades for about 12 years. And I'll get into that in a little bit here. But it never made sense to me. And I'm just going to share my screen. That if we we're teaching in the trades, that we would put our students that, into classrooms that look like this. So we have our students staring at the back of each other's heads. And we had them staring up at a whiteboard and there would be an instructor sharing some issues and problems and, and working things out on the board. And it never really clicked with me, especially when we're trying to have our students learn how to construct things, how to troubleshoot and maintain, and how to problem solve and collaborate. So as I am going through this presentation, I want to talk about how I kind of arrived at open pedagogy and how I implemented that into a trades-based education. Now, of course, there's some things that we can take for all of education in this. And I also teach in a school of business as well. And so there's some of the, the things that I take into that as well. So if we're going to be walking this journey, we need to talk about a student of mine named Kevin and how this all began for me. So Kevin is the gentleman that's sitting on the front there. He's got the purple shoelaces on and the baseball cap. I taught at a foundation program at BCIT in what was the electrical foundation program. So I would get students that were a wide range of experiences. Some would come in having never touched a tool to some having used tools their whole life. Some who are just straight out of high school to some who had master's degrees and just needed to, a change of careers. And some who are like 17 years old up to 55. And so Kevin sat in kind of the center of all of that. Kevin's story was this. I got an email from Kevin about a week before classes started asking if I could give him a call. So I called Kevin up and he asked if it would be possible at all if he could leave early on Fridays and come in late on Mondays. <laughs> I thought, okay, who wouldn't want that? That seems to work well for me. So sure, let's, let's talk and figure out what's going on. So Kevin's story is this. Kevin told me that he was, um, his wife was nine months pregnant and he was working at a pulp mill that was about three hours north of the Vancouver area from where the school was. He really wanted to change his career path. At the time, he was an operator, so he would literally press a green button or a red button for 12-hour shifts. With a new baby on the way, he wanted to change his life. So he thought he'd always wanted to be an electrician. This would be a good place to start. The only problem was the only way he could afford to do that was if he stayed working. So he worked something out with his boss at the mill where he could work Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And so what I mean by that is he would leave school at about noon on Friday, drive three hours north, work from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. Friday night, 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. Saturday night, 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. Sunday night, get back in his car and drive and would arrive at school at about 10 a.m., 10 or 11 a.m. on the Monday morning. So Kevin and I worked something out, and I'm going to come back to Kevin's story towards the end of the, the, um, the program here of my presentation. But it made me realize that there, there was a lot of Kevins in my time teaching. There have been many Kevins before and many Kevins after. And so what it really made me think of is how can I help these Kevins out, these, these students that have to try to work and, and are, they've got these lives on top of just going to school. So that took me down the, the path of cost of books. That's one area that I as an instructor could help kind of ease on. So I, I learned about the idea of open educational resources. 
And through that, I, I reached out and looked, finding where can I find these open educational resources? So the access to this. And one of the repositories I found, there's many of them, but one of the best ones I found was BC Campus. At the time, they did have some trades-based OER. Uh, they've, they've grown that library exponentially. Like, it's amazing how much they've got in there now. But at the time, there was enough to get started on it. And so it was enough just to get interested in. But there were still some gaps. And so I started looking into how could I, as an instructor, fill these gaps? I, I, I like the idea of these open educational resources, but they didn't fill everything that I needed. So what could I do? Well, I could start creating my own stuff. And as I started diving into this idea of knowledge creation, I'm going to tell another story about a student of mine. There's a student, Elton, and Elton was a great kid. He came up to me at the end of class and he said, I wish that I could just knock you on the back of the head, throw you in the trunk of my car and take you home with me. And I thought, okay, well, that's, that's a little creepy, but okay, I'm, I'm willing to see how this conversation goes. So I asked him what was up. And Elton said, he, he got it when he was in class. He got the concepts. He understood it when he's working in the groups. He understood it when he's working in the class on his worksheets. The problem was, was by the time he got home after leaving school, going to the gym, hanging out with some friends, seeing his family, and then sitting down for homework, he would be missing things. He'd be forgetting things. So I started thinking, well, what is a way that I could kind of help with this? So I started making these little tutorial videos, little walkthrough examples of the concepts they're going through. So I started sharing them with him in the class, just as some uh, resources there for them. They started sharing them with other classes so and asking if we could do that. And I said, that's not a problem at all. So I ended up putting the videos up on uh, YouTube. And so I started this Electric Academy. That was about four years ago. And it seems to have it's taken off a bit. I've got 35,000 subscribers and it's growing all the time. So there is definitely a need for these short style, just quick three to five minute videos. And we're, we've seen that already. This is nothing that new. We've seen that, especially with the pandemic. Another area that I looked into and dove deep into was actually creating textbooks. So I was very fortunate to be able to get some grants from BCIT and BC Campus to create some textbooks. I worked with a couple of amazing collaborators, Mark Overgaard, who's a piping instructor. Um, we worked out some math for trades books and another instructor, Aaron Lee, an electrical instructor from BCIT. And so we, we started creating our own and started adding some more resources to the BC Campus Library. Now, as engaged as I could possibly be and as exciting as I could be and fun as I could be in class, I would still see this student. And we've all experienced or had this student in our class. Maybe not this particular student, but we know the student that we're, we're, we're talking about here. The ones that no matter what we do are sleeping on, falling asleep or doing whatever, just not engaged with our class. And I just want to go on to a little bit of a well-intentioned rant at this point. One thing that I noticed when we're going into this is a lot of instructors, and especially when I came up through the system as well, if they were harsh in their ways, it could be justified because of the popular opinion that the student was a troublemaker. And as I've actually gotten to know my students and talk to them and found out why they've been sleeping in classes or why they've been disruptive, I start to realize that our students, and I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, but our students walk into our classrooms, not as empty vessels, but they're dragging their whole lives behind them. So the students that have fallen asleep in class, perhaps the reason why they've fallen asleep in class is because they've been up all night working or they have a new baby or they're, they are living in their van. Like these are all instances of students that I've experienced. So what I really think that we need to start doing a lot more of is we need to start trusting our students, realizing that, yes, there are some bad actors out there and there are some that are trying to game the system. But in my experience, they are not the majority. They are the minority. So why are we focusing so much on them? Why do we not focus more on the ones who need our help? So I could go on and on about this. So I'm just going to, I've got this slide in here. This as a callback to remind me that I keep on going, but I could definitely talk more about that. So this made me realize that up to this point, it was all eyes on Chad, all eyes on me. I, I was the one creating the videos. I was the one building the resources and the textbooks. And then I, at the time, I was also going to Royal Roads University in the Master of Arts and Learning and Technologies. And I started learning about this concept of open pedagogy. And so I love this quote by Sean Michael Morris that says, if after so many years of controlling student behavior, analyzing their data to understand and curtail that behavior, we're still unhappy with their performance, Perhaps it's time we turn education over to them. And perhaps it's time we made them our colleagues. And so that's when I decided that it was time for me to dive headfirst into this concept of open pedagogy. So when we talk about open pedagogy, it's important that we, we come up with a definition. So I'm going to give a quick and easy definition of open, open pedagogy here. Now, I have this slide open because as many people are in this session right now, that's how many different definitions of open pedagogy we can have. 
It is a complex, messy conversation. And that's what I love about it. It infuriates me and just, I love it at the same time. So what I'm going to do is give you the definition, the working definition I'm going to use for this, this session here. But again, we're always open for discussion. So the way we look at it is open educational practices or open pedagogy or teaching and learning practices where openness is enacted within all aspects of instructional practice, including the design of learning outcomes, the selection of teaching resources, and the planning of activities and assessment. OEP engage both faculty and students with the use and creation of OER, draw attention to the potential afforded by open licenses, facilitate open peer review, and support participatory student-directed projects. So I love this in the sense that they talk about both faculty and students. So this is Michael Pascovesius, and I love that it's this, this intermingling, this working together. So this is a group that I, I went through a, a project with. It was a couple of years ago. It was a fantastic group. They're really engaged. I had a habit of leaving my phone unlocked on my desk. They had a habit of taking my phone and taking pictures. So I wanted to include a picture of them. Um, I had to censor some of the pictures because there's the hand gestures that probably wouldn't have been appropriate to, sh to share here, but they were just a fantastic group. So one thing that I did was I mentioned, I didn't feel like this was the way to go, having our students staring at the back of each other's heads while I did all the talking. So what I did was I moved them into pods. So they were always in groups of four. I was lucky in the sense that every classroom had 16 students, so I could always have four groups of four. These students would shift around. So they would work together in a unit, whatever unit we were in, with that, those same four people. And then the next week, I would shift them up. So they would end up working in the six months they were with me with everybody in the class more than, more than probably two or three times. So they got to know each other really well. Some of the projects I got to work them on, and this is only some of them because in the interest of time, I had them build their own OER. So what I would do is I created a Google slide deck that had nothing but headings and subheadings in it. So right now I have these, these examples that I have up here. I have where it says RL circuits and the information below. All they would have received was RL circuits. They would have to fill in the information below that. Same with how to demagnetize a magnet. All it said was how to demagnetize a magnet. All the formatting, all the images and everything that were put into it was on them. We had a lot of discussions about open licenses and creative commons and all that idea too. So they were, it was up to them whether or not they felt safe sharing it as OER. Um, in my experience, almost every, I only had one group not want to share. They got right into it. They were so excited. They had hyperlink table of contents. They, I had them create their own self-test, letting them know that these little unit tests that they would put in their, their resources, I, f I found great questions. I would be taking those questions and putting into their actual summative exams. So it might be in their best interest, actually, once they were done, their project is to share it with the other groups as well, because there's going to be questions from there. So they started sharing these projects together and working with them. It was an absolutely unbelievable. And some of the the quality of the textbooks that they created because it was in their vernacular, their language and not above their heads. Cause oftentimes, especially in trade school, we get these engineering textbooks given to our students. It wouldn't be in their language. So they could actually take it and put it into their own language. I would have them evaluate. So instead of me always giving them a mark, I would have them evaluate themselves and then they would have to evaluate the other group members. At the beginning, it was hilarious because, well, it's not hilarious, but they would always give themselves a low mark, as would be expected, and they would always give their friends 100%. And their comments were like, this guy rocked it. He was great. I, I watched. That guy didn't rock it. That guy wasn't great. He did nothing. So we started talking about how it's important to have discussions about criticism, to be a critical friend, about how industry requires us to actually be able to, to give criticism in a creative and a constructive manner. So it took a little bit of nudging, but then towards the end of the course, they, I had actually had them creating and being their own rubrics and working on the shop projects as well as evaluating each other on these textbook projects that they were working on. Another area is I really wanted to focus on authentic assignments. I never wanted to have them do things that they would end up throwing out at the end of it. So luckily with trades, a lot of the projects that they would do are, are things that they could take away with them. However, there was also some theory-based stuff. So I would take things like when we got into electronics, instead of just lecturing at them about different components of electronics, I had them work on what we called the Raspberry Pi project. Now, the Raspberry Pis are little microcomputers that are about the size of a credit card, extremely cheap, and there's about one billion different projects out there. A lot of high schools use them. And so I had them pick their own projects for it. So as some examples here. There's some three examples here. I have 
Ben and Greg here were super excited because they had actually uploaded the op Linux operating system to their Raspberry Pi to get that running. So they're quite excited about that. The second group in the center here, there was some hardware that they were building for a gaming system that they were building. And on the far right here, we have a student, the students working on their building a Wi-Fi booster. And what they were trying to do is they hadn't uploaded the latest firmware. And so they were getting really frustrated. And so the gentleman that's wearing the, the hoodie there, his name is Harnack, and he is 17 years old, right out of high school. One of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. Just a really, really nice, nice kid. When he was getting frustrated, I heard words that came out of his mouth that made me blush. And I'm a tradesperson. I've heard it all. But he was, he was getting so frustrated. So they would always come to me and ask me to, to give them the, the solution to their problem. I never would, which got them really frustrated, but I would gently nudge them in the right direction. And so at the end of it, they figured out exactly what the problem was. They were working off of an old firmware. They uploaded that firmware, and you should have seen the smile and the pride in their eyes when they actually worked that through. Now, these are just some of the projects I worked on in the interest of time, because this is only a 15 to 20 minute session. There's lots of others, and I'd be love to talk more about some of the other projects that I work with them on. But I promised that I wanted to come back to Kevin. Now, Kevin, I had four or five years ago as a student. This is Kevin today with his family. The, the little girl there in the purple shirt, that was the one who was born. She was born actually two weeks after we started class. Kevin, as he went through the, pr the program with us, turned out to be one of the best students in my 12 years of teaching that I've ever seen. He was a leader. He, was, he had a great attitude. He was smart. He was there to help the others. And yes, he did leave early on Fridays. And yes, he did arrive late on Mondays. And sometimes we, he took Mondays off just to sleep, but he put in the work. And so it really makes me think that how many Kevins did I leave behind in the process when, before I actually decided to do something about it? And thank God for Kevin, because I did everything I could to prevent for future Kevins. So that's, to me, the importance of open pedagogy is we were able to do things to take these steps in those right directions. Now, as I come to a close on my presentation, I want to end with this one last quote. We need more, not fewer ways to listen for the voices of students reflecting on education, we need more, not fewer ways to include students in conversations about the future of teaching and learning in college. And I really, truly do believe that we need to, they're our number one stakeholder. We need to have listen to their voice more often. And I just want to put my contact information up there as well. If you want to get a hold of me, that's my email address. I love talking about this stuff. If you want to hear more of the projects I've been working on. And I'm very active on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. So I definitely... Would encourage you to have as many conversations as you can with this. And if you want, I'm always open for a conversation. So thank you very much. I had a question and it's something that I um, struggle with as an instructor is that sometimes accessibility kind of cuts both ways, if you know what I mean. So for example, you might have one student who really appreciates weekly deadlines because it helps them maintain discipline and another student might need flexibility. So how... How, how have you addressed that issue in your teaching? That's such a great question. So when I trying to build this presentation and, and keep it under 20 minutes, I actually took out a chunk where I actually had the students speaking and what they thought of the projects. Some really liked to have that. Some didn't. Uh, it was a lot of conversations as to why I felt this was important. A lot of them pushed back at the beginning, especially because they just wanted to do the work to get the grade. And so we had a lot of conversations about that. By the end, they were all bought in. But it was very different. And when you, you're kind of pushing them out, outside of it, it was out, difficult for me to kind of step outside and get rid of my lesson plans. It was also difficult for them to step outside and do something completely different than the way that they had been taught before. So it was just like any good relationship. It was about the communication and just always being open to have those, those chats. Mm, that's a good lesson. Thank you. I see, and uh, thank you, Danielle, uh, put in the chat that there's a term for that phenomenon, which is disability friction. I had not mm. heard that term before. So thank you, Danielle. Um, one other question, I think, from Alexandra before we move on, the how white might we question, what would help us leverage the hands-on nature of trades education in wider context, including community-based learning, maker education, for example? I mean, that's a whole session unto itself. Um, one thing I, that I find, I just watched a TED talk with Seth Godin talking about education and his, his rant was, if you're talking at your students, don't do that. Put it in a video and let them watch it later. Use the time you're with your students to engage in projects with your students. So again, I understand like workload and all that, trying to redesign your, your projects is a, a whole other thing in your, your curriculum. 
but it is so much fun to be able to do that. And he's so right. Like, and he, like, he even goes out to say like, don't even bother recording yourself for a lecture, find a great lecture. Cause there's somebody that's already lectured on what you need and they've done it better than you. <laughs> and so find it out there and get your students to watch it and then make sure that, so yeah, like Eric Mazur in the flipped classroom for sure. And he's got some interesting thoughts lately on that as well. Thank you so much um, for getting us started this morning and for uh, such an interesting perspective. I think we will now move on to our next uh, speaker. Um, we are lucky to be joined uh, by two folks from the University of Lethbridge. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Jan Newberry, who's a professor in the anthropology department, joined by Alyssa White, uh, who is a master's student at ULEP in the anthropology department. And they are going to be talking about their project, Open Anthropology, OERs, Open Pedagogy and Accessibility in Anthropology. So welcome, uh, Jan and Alyssa. So yeah, I'm a uh, professor of anthropology and Alyssa is an anthropology master's student in her second semester. My job here today is to provide a little context for our work together starting with some changes I made in my own uh, teaching and learning approaches and leading to Alyssa's master's project, which is a collabor collaboration between the two of us. As, I put, as we put this uh, presentation together, I realized that the connective thread is really co-inquiry and I'll talk about that a little bit. So in 2015, I completely redesigned my intro anthropology course to use team-based learning. I won't spend very much time on this and I'm happy to answer questions about it in the Q&A. The, the important thing here is that students work together in permanent teams across the semester. And the research that we've done so far on this suggests that the peer-to-peer -peer teaching is one of the uh, central strengths of this approach. And although it's not always called co-inquiry, this is in fact a form of co-inquiry between students. So following that uh, first uh, introduction to TBL in 2016, I actually wanted to figure out whether this was working or not. And so decided to actually embed uh, students who'd taken that intro course along with some senior anthropology majors into the classroom as field workers and they were going to use the methods of anthropology, which of course I was teaching about in this class as well. They became participant observers. They took detailed field notes. They managed the insider-outsider sta status of being both a student, but not a student in, that, in, in this particular class. But what was so wonderful about this uh, project was that they would work with me to analyze what they were seeing in the classroom and to do some preliminary coding. So this blossomed into a project of co-inquiry where their analysis of what was happening in the classroom actually helped me change my teaching in real time. Uh, and it became a real collaboration between them and me as the class went forward. Another ingredient of the story I'm telling today is a seminar that I taught in the fall of 2020 about ethnographic methods. And uh, teaching it when I did, it had to respond to the TRC's calls to action. What were the nature, what is the nature of our methods and, and should they be uh, considered again? So I drew very strongly on the work of Sarah Ahmed, who talks about citational politics, who gets, who gets cited and who doesn't get cited. But I also drew on the work of Miriam Durrani, who said, look, when we design our syllabus, we should think instead of taking that standard chronos approach, here's the chronology of the discipline and how it developed, and instead take a Kairos approach. What do we need to talk about in the now? And so that seminar was really uh, tremendously generative for me. Alyssa was in that class. And in fact, we sort of opened up the canon uh, and in fact reversed the chronology to look at it. So it was a terrific moment for me in thinking about uh, anthropology and the teaching of anthropology. Immediately after this, Alyssa joined me as one of six tutors who helped me take this TBL approach, this team-based learning approach into an online classroom. Terrifying. Uh, so we ran this kind of chaotic experience 
uh, with 175 plus students and, and six tutors. And because it was quite chaotic, I decided for the first time to use a textbook. And I used an open access textbook out of the University of Alberta, in fact, uh, primarily to reduce the costs for my students in this sort of uh, moment of, of instability. And my primary motive was to, to reduce costs. This turned into a project for Alyssa that led her to graduate school and her current research project, which is to build an open educational resource with me as a kind of collaborative co-inquiry project. And I'll have to say, as I turn it over to her, as she has done this, she has opened up my ideas about what open education and open access can actually mean. Over to you, Alyssa. Uh, so as Jan kind of talked about, my work really began in the last semester of my undergraduate degree when I was working as a tutor with Jan in the intro class, which was just as terrifying as she <laughs> told you all it was. And part of my work as well was conducting some independent research on the OER we are using and what it could be used for in the future. And as I was looking at this textbook and as we were using it in real time in the classroom and going through the chapters, we kind of started to realize that while we loved some of these aspects of the OER, it didn't quite line up with everything we wanted to talk about in the intro class at our university. And there were some aspects that we wished we could have tweaked. Um, so that was where my research kind of came into play is looking at what does this licensing mean and can we tweak it and can we build it into something of our own and how does the remixing work and so i did a bunch of research um, throughout that last semester looking at oers and open pedagogy and open access to knowledge and as i was moving through this research um, i got to experience that kind of open pedagogical approach myself because this was the first time i'd kind of conducted research as a collaborator with a faculty member as opposed to being in a class doing research in a kind of constraint of a classroom. And Jan and I were actually learning about this together and, and we were teaching each other about it as we moved through this research. And that led me to graduate school, um, which I'm in my second semester now, as Jan mentioned, and we decided that we wanted to look at building a resource for the anthropology department uh, at the university here that would address some of these questions we had and some of these concerns around um, filling in gaps that we were seeing. And another big component as well is I wanted to bring this um, kind of open pedagogical approach into it as well because it had transformed my learning so much in my undergraduate degree. I wanted other students to be involved in this. I want other students to take part in it and I wanted them to experience the kind of transformation that a lot of students report when they are given agency over their learning. And so we began putting this together for the intro class that I became the graduate TA of in the fall last semester and started sort of <laughs> trying to figure it out and built a little skeleton draft that we could test with students to see how they were feeling about it and how they were receptive to it in the classroom. And all of this work was happening at a time, and I'm going to take this time to brag about our answer department because we have a really, really amazing one where we have all of these undergraduate students conducting a ton of independent research outside of classrooms that is just so amazing that we don't get to talk about enough or see enough of. So this is actually a list of just a sample of some of the independent and applied studies that students have been doing in the department on about a multitude of topics throughout our department. And as I was having conversations with other undergraduates at the time and talking about graduate school, a lot of them talked quite a bit about how we want our work to matter. We're pursuing this research because we're passionate about these topics. We don't get to see them as much in the classroom as we'd like, and we want it to matter. We want it to exist outside of just a single semester of research that we're conducting. So that was a really important thread as well that we were thinking about as we were putting together how we would begin the OER. One of these students is Adjalisha Roche, who is a fifth year undergraduate student in the department who I have done quite a bit of work with um, towards building the OER. She actually built a small piece for our introductory students to read about Black anthropology last semester, which is a topic that we don't get to touch on a ton in intro classes when there's so much uh, material to cover. And as I was talking to her about what's important to you about this and how do you feel about doing this work and are you okay with students reading this and how will this be for you, she really emphasized to me that she was seeing this kind of um, lacking in the department of talking about this topic. And so she decided to pursue it herself. But what was so important to her is that she could take this work and other students like her who are maybe seeing a little bit of a gap 
where they weren't being represented could see it as well. And all of that nervousness around <laughs> other students reading her work and those concerns around what will my work turn into was really bolstered by this idea of other students will learn from it and I can have other students have that representation that I also want as well. And I want to share it. She has this quote that I love to repeat. So um, share it rather than working in these contained spaces of independent research or in classrooms where we don't share our work. So students really wanted to be involved in this. And it wasn't just uh, students like Julisha who were actively contributing as well. It was our um, interest students too. So they actually had a big part because we test ran this draft with them about what the OER would be. And so we were in constant talk with them throughout the class of how is this working for you? And what do you want from this? And what do you wish you had instead? And do you like this aspect of it? Do you not like this aspect of it? And we are also opening up this idea of talking about accessibility to them in terms of class content, in terms of their readings. And so these students really had a fundamental impact on shaping the OER and the direction it's going, just as students in the class were participating and reading um, this draft that we were working on. And this is actually a word cloud um, that the students generated um, after talking to them about accessibility and open access and those sorts of things in the classroom. So we're starting to bring these conversations into these classrooms and having these students be a part of them. So we're involving students at all levels and having that aspect of collaboration that's shaping the OER as it's developing. And so as Jan kind of talked about as well at the beginning, as we're slowly working through this OER and what it will be, one thing that has really <laughs> become into focus for me is this has become so much more than just cost saving for students. This is becoming a much larger project and this is where my research is kind of moving towards as I make my way through my master's. And so when we talk about open to students and when I talk about, I talk about open to other faculty members and to Jan as well, we talk about open in anthropology. These are some of the kind of things that we're talking about. We're not just talking about saving students costs or making um, textbooks that can be accessed online. We're talking about knowledge and who has the ability to legitimize it in post-secondary and who doesn't. We're talking about destabilizing hierarchies and flattening those hierarchies and providing access for other individuals to be involved in areas they've traditionally been excluded from. We're talking about decolonization, particularly in anthropology and paying attention to the voices that have been erased in academia and making sure they're at the forefront of these conversations. We're talking about dissemination and spreading information and making sure that everybody has access to this information. We're talking about working in the public, which, which is a really important conversation, not only in academia, but especially in anthropology of making sure that when we're working in communities, we're not just taking this knowledge from them and putting it behind a paywall. We're talking about accessibility in the broadest sense. So making sure that knowledge is accessible to students, not just in the sense of can they afford it, but does it make sense to them? Can they understand it? Does it support their learning in the best possible way? We're talking about collaboration at all levels, not just between faculty and students, but students themselves, between faculty and librarians, between students and librarians, because librarians play such a huge part of this as well. We're talking about inclusivity and making sure that students see themselves in the readings and the pieces that they are consuming in class and making sure they're represented in the best way possible. We're talking about multimodality, so making sure that we're not just focusing on the traditional Western text-based way of learning, but including all forms of knowledge and all ways of knowing so that students can also access those. And we're also talking about power, who has the power to determine this, who has the power to access it, and how we make sure that we flatten that so that everyone has access to this knowledge and the production of it. And at the end of the day, that is what we are <laughs> looking to tackle with this OER is how do we address all of these concerns how do we bring this into our department? How do we represent our department? And how do we make this knowledge accessible to everybody? Thank you, Jen and Melissa. That was a, a really powerful testimonial about the, the power of OER. Um, and it's great to hear uh, students speak to this. I think uh, many of us in the room who are instructors have, have had these individual interactions with students. And I think, Alyssa, you articulated those so powerfully. Um, I see one question uh, for Alyssa in the chat, and I would encourage others to submit their questions uh, or unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, as your undergraduate experience transformed your approach to learning, how did it shape your approach to what counts as knowledge worth learning? 
I think um, as an anthropology major, I might have a different answer than some other disciplines already, but especially it made me really pay attention to, and this was not just um, the open pedagogy that I experienced, but also that decolonizing seminar that Jan taught that I was a part of. It really made me pay attention to uh, this idea that all knowledge is worth knowing in some form or another, and all knowledge is worth engaging with in some way or another. Um, we talk a lot in anthropology about the importance of stories and how much we love stories. And that's because I think that stories are knowledge and everybody has their own stories that counts as knowledge. So it really made me pay attention to engaging with knowledge in a different way and paying attention to, even though I look at this knowledge or this story, this idea initially, and I don't understand the point of it, that doesn't mean it doesn't have value. And so I need to spend more time engaging with it in order to understand its value and its merit and bring it into my work in that way. Maybe I have a question um, for you, Jan, as an instructor and as a, a, a more senior academic in, in, this, in this relationship, watching your students have these different impetuses for engaging in scholarship and making their work open and sharing it in different ways, how does it make you think differently about the incentives in academia for, in things like, you know, advancement, tenure promotion, and how might we pave the path for graduate students and undergraduate students today to be successful in these new ways of sharing and disseminating knowledge? Wow, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, Especially (laughs) in a uh, symposium that, you know, sponsored by a Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, I mean, my own experience with that at my campus is how our our uh, teaching center has worked really hard to get the word out that this counts and is you know is legitimate work and and you know there's been a real support for the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, in a sense. But you know, as I say that to you, Christy, I mean, I think it's a, it's in a, a sort of an invitation to continue to use the research brain. Or the research standard to look at teaching and you know to translate that way, which is is, is too bad in a, in a sense. So to go back to the first part of your question, you know the 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 work that I have gotten to do and it's been a total pleasure with students is not just that they are helping me, but that they have become my co-researchers and have actually shaped my research in in SOTL, um research and in, in profoundly. Um, and so that has really changed how I think about, I have to, let me stop and say it in a slightly different way. I think, I mean, when I started doing research on the scholarship of teaching and learning, I came with my anthropology research hat and thought, okay, does it really, is it really, is that really research? Um, and, and didn't give it the same sort of value and prestige that I did in my other uh, world. And I think this process has really made me rethink that um, and, and that, uh, I think this is a bit of a meandering uh, reply, and I apologize for that. That then has actually been braided with the calls to decolonize how we teach and how we do research. Um, and there was a comment in the chat about community based research, and I do that as well. All of the elements you see here are there as well. Like it moves beyond participation to how do we collaborate and research alongside one another rather than me coming in and facilitating my research with your participation. So big, uh, uh, as I said, I'm sort of rambling here. The, the, The big question you're asking, I don't think has been solved still inside of academia, which is how to, uh, regard and reward this kind of work effectively for junior scholars. My hope would be that more are doing it from the beginning instead like me who falls into it later in my career and that the opportunities will continue to open because for those reasons. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm really reflecting on what you said about the power of, of praxis and just doing it and how that changes your perspective. I think that's a really, really interesting insight. Well, and I, I will say just to, that, you know, Alyssa got me here. <laughs> Alyssa is the reason I'm here today. And that I'm thinking about open access in the way that I am, right? Not that I didn't care about my teaching or wasn't doing research, but it was because of her. And then modeling that, that work with her has affected other students. So I think that that is the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Great. I see a question in the chat from Sarah. 
asking how did you assess or review for EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, quality of language, and concepts? I can uh, take this question. I don't have a full answer for you. Um, we're still very much in the beginning stages of putting together the OER and slowly making our way through it. But the biggest component that has been really eye-opening for me has been just having those conversations with students and faculty um, of all areas, of all disciplines, of all standings. Um, I considered myself a student who's fairly aware of accommodations and accessibility concerns and then talking to the students in the 1000 about how is this, this um, working for you? They brought up things that I had never thought about before. Um, talking to other students in the department too. So just making sure that you're talking to and collaborating with and consulting as many individuals as possible so they can bring in all of those um, worldviews and experiences to help shape your resources, how I've been approaching it so far. 